No one could predict what's going to happen. Hashem runs the world. God runs the world, and he'll, you don't know his master plan. I was asked by the Lakewood Scoop to give an update on the last video that I did. So the goal of this update is really just to tell you some of the main questions that have been flowing back and forth, and certain things you should focus on for the going forward as you start making decisions. Nobody knows what's going, going to happen. And the hedge fund guru, Yitzhi Markowitz, explained to me a concept called collective thinking. And to me, I never heard of it. Seems like a lot of people did hear of it. And it's fascinating. They say a professor took a, a jar of je jelly beans, a whole big jar, and he asked his class to guess how many jelly beans are in the jar. Not one person came close. Yet, when they took the average of everyone who, in the class, the average was within 2% of the answer. Many times people wake up in the morning and they ask, where's the stock market going to be today? And totally, you thought it should go up based on the recent news, went down, vice versa, who knows what's happening. But if you take collective thinking, that's going to rule, that's going to rule the day going forward. My father, in blessed memory, Zatali, used to tell me that when it comes to sales, it's very important that you follow the way the wind is blowing. And try never to make a sale unless you know you're going to get the yes. Ask as many questions as you want. Follow the wind. Same concept. So the example would be, if I was doing home mortgages, I do commercial mortgages, but I was doing home mortgages, there are some people who want 15-year mortgages versus 30-year mortgages. You're not going to be able to convince someone that wants a 30 that it's better to take a 15-year and vice versa. So if you want to sell to a 30, if you have a product for 30-30, if you don't have that product, you're better off not trying to sell it. You're better off just moving on to somebody else. So the first obvious question is that people are asking today, is my money safe? at the banks. So regarding, let's talk about Signature and Silicon Valley. I'll take Signature as an example. Quite frankly, in my humble opinion, I can't advise anybody. I think that right now it is the safest bank in the world because the government came out saying is they're backing it. There's even a rumor going on that they might not sell Signature Bank. The person they brought in, a great person from Fifth Third Bank to run it, supposedly is only earning a dollar and he has 30 or 60 or 90 days to put a proposal together to build out a team that the government will run Signature Bank as a bank and then sell it at a big profit in a couple of years from now. So it'll be Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Signature Bank. So yeah, I think Signature is the best. Is every other bank safe in the middle? I would have to believe that they're safe. I'm sure if some of the spike happens, now they're talking about Credit Suisse, something happens, there's going to be some bank they can let fail and they won't cover the deposits above 250. I don't think it's that likely. But I really think it's happening, and the way the wind is really blowing, is that, as you heard it when the president got up and he said his speech, shareholders, he's not protecting. Depositors, they want to protect. I think the goal right now is going to be to get the banks to merge from the 3,000 plus lenders that are out there to less than 1,000. Have like accounting firms, have the big four, have the top four banks, top five banks, top 10 banks, then have regionals, a couple in every single state, then have down to the submarkets, have community banks. Community banks are very important. They know the local barber, they know the local businesses. Regional banks have more money and they're pretty close to be able to helping out businesses as they grow. And then it comes to the national banks that, that could be for the masses at that point. So on the banking side, I think the money is, gonna, is relatively safe in the short term wherever you're going. But the long term, once you have the wind of the government, what are they going to do to enforce that wind? They're already talking about raising regulation, making certain requirements. But think about it. How many people, collective thinking, say, you know something? I have my hard-earned money. And I'm not going to keep it in a local bank unless they pay me a lot more than the top few banks that I know are safe. Like people think Chase is safe. Too, it's, never gonna, it's too big to fail. They're never going to let Chase go down. So if that's the case, they're going to have to pay higher deposits. If they have more regulation, they can, they're going to have to keep more money on their books. And they're not going to be able to lend it out. They have to lend at a very high rate. Are they going to get the good borrowers? So I think it's going to force banks to stop merging. Many of the banks that I'm close with, the, the, and, I, and, I, and I speak to them, I ask them, what is the number one reason that banks haven't merged in these last few years? So the number one reason is ego. There are humans at the bank. And if two banks merge, who's going to run the bank? Do you think someone ran a bank their whole life, they want to merge now and they be number two, or be pushed out? So therefore, the mergers didn't happen at the rate they should have happened. But now, when they're facing unfortunate what happened at Signature Bank, that all the bankers think about that their life savings in stock gone to zero, and the shareholders are zero. When investors in the banks are realizing, hey, we may come to a problem soon. We might be worth zero. When the guns to the head of the, or the shot clock is running out, they're going to make those moves pretty quick. 
and you'll see a lot more merges between all the, the, the wind blowing in this direction, where the government wants it, where the investors are talking, and just practically under the hood. How could they be profitable at those numbers? What is the biggest risk to the market right now? Is the same risk that happened to the bank. What's called mark to market. What mark to market means is that you have to own up and admit that how much are you really worth. So when you have a stock, it's very easy. Stocks trade throughout the whole day. So if I have 100 shares of a stock that's at a dollar, I'm worth $100 worth of stock. If the stock goes to a dollar fifty, I have $150 worth of stock. What happens when you buy a building? How much is the building worth? You bought the building a few years ago for $10 million. What is it worth today? Is the building worth more than $10 million, less than $10 million? Now, it's not really relevant to me how much my net worth is. How does it affect my day-to-day life? But this is where it starts making a difference. A bank, it makes a difference because the bank has to have a certain amount of liquidity available to them, a certain amount of backup they could sell in case they have to go ahead and recoup things. That's what caused the, the issue right now. These banks had treasury bills, which are maturing in, let's say, 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years. If they would have held it out to maturity, they'd be fine. The problem was the short term, they were losing money because every day they were collecting, they were, they were, they were getting paid. The, the amount they were getting paid on the bond, the amount they were collecting in interest, there was an issue. So they were losing a couple of percent a year. But if they held out to the end, they recoup all their money. So the issue came in that the mark to market, because they had to sell today, and they realized, hey, all these bonds aren't worth as much if I had to sell today. And based on that, that's where the lenders started showing issues. The risk to the industry is, with other lenders have to start mark to market other things? Or would they not have to mark to market other things? And if yes, what is the damage going to be from that? That's why the government right now is, starting, is willing to lend to the banks to keep them afloat. If they have bonds, treasuries, they're able to, they're able to use the government will lend them against those treasuries for a year. So this is where they could work things out over the next year. This mark to market concept starts applying to commercial real estate. Commercial real estate owners all have adjustable rate loans which basically means they don't have a 30, they have a 30 year loan, but after five, seven or 10 years, it matures and they have to refinance. So right now, every real estate owner, commercial real estate owner, for the most part is doing great. They have their building, everything is fine, they're cash flowing. On paper, the value of the, 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 the building is up or down. But if they have a loan coming due in two years, three years, four years, five years, at that time, there's gonna be a day of reckoning. What is the value of the real estate really at that time? And so right now they could be fine, but the question is, what's it worth then? The reason why that's important is because they have to refinance. But they could be coming into an environment where, hey, they could have bought a building for $9 million. They could have took a $7 million loan. The building could be worth, could have gone up to worth $10 million at one point. And now with cap rates up, rates up, maybe the building is below worth less than $9 million. It still might be fine, but if it goes a little bit down to $8 million, because cap rates are really higher, like I explained in the last video, they might only be able to refinance and be able to borrow $6 million. What are they going to do? They're going to have to go in an $8 million building, only be able to finance $6 million, but the bank is owed seven. They don't have the money. They're going to have to sell the building for $8 million and pay the bank a million. And then now the net worth is a million dollars, really, instead of being worth $3 million at one point, that $10 million value and a $7 million loan. Well, if they have to, to underwrite today that mark to market, that means a bank has to admit today that the $7 million loan they have is in trouble because they won't be able to refinance it for seven, refinance it for six unless they force the bar to sell. What's gonna happen? This is the complicated piece. At what point are people gonna to have to recognize mark to market and how it affects them? So unlike the banks who were great at maturity on their bonds, real estate owners have to deal with the fact that reality, where the cap rates are gonna be at that time, where values are gonna be, number one. But there's now two new issues popped up. What are the rates gonna be? Even if the value is good, but can they afford to refinance their existing debt at the higher rate? There's an article printed this morning that first-time home buyers are now becoming um, um, homeowners are now becoming first-time renters. Because if you're selling your house, are you going to sell a house that has a three percent mortgage and then now borrow at a much higher rate and lose that three percent? Or are you going to take your house that you have right now, rent it out, take the extra cash flow, and help you on the new house that you're buying to make those payments? Same thing's going to happen over here. We have a someone has a building seven years out, ten in, in five years. They're going to have to now deal with the fact that rates are up. But there's a third piece now. How's regulation going to take a place? A bank still going to lend at 75% leverage, 80%, 70%. What's going to happen? My personal recommendation on this is that if someone has a loan coming due in the next two years even, refinance today, even if today they're paying a little bit higher. 
Secure yourself a new five years from this point going forward. So you don't have to worry about anything and everything will flush out over these next five years. Where I see opportunity and why G Parency were brokering LP equity means regular investors that want to put money directly to owners is because in that situation, which leads me to my 1031 exchange, the next big issue is that in that scenario, the building is now worth 8 million on paper and they can only refinance for 6 million because of that. Instead of selling it, the person would rather take a partner for that million and instead of maybe giving away 50%, try to work out a deal and find a partner that believes in the upside and only take 40%. So the owner doesn't have to sell the building and, and, and only be left with a million and lose half their equity. Instead, they could hold on to it and go, go forward. Here's the other piece of the puzzle, 1031 exchanges. Whoever did a 1031 exchange cannot let the bank take their building back because then they're on the hook for the tax liability at that time. A major, major real estate owner, I don't have permission to mention his name, so I won't mention it, told me that 1030, his father trained him, that 1031s are like borrowing money from the mafia, but there's no interest rate. The difference is, if you have to pay them back, because you have a problem, you have to pay them back. You can't avoid paying them back. It didn't accrue at any interest rate, but you're gonna have to pay them back. So now this scenario is, in a case like I just gave you, someone who owned that building as a 1031 exchange doesn't have the option to sell. And if, and if the building is only worth $7.2 million, he just has to sell 98% of the building to somebody else, but he must maintain some ownership or else he's in trouble because he'll be due the tax savings that he deferred left to pay at that time. So because of this, in general, there's going to be a lot less sales because I think in the going forward, people are going to say, you know, some told me a great line that in the last market, it created sellers. When I buy something for 10 million out of left field, someone offers me 12, yeah, I'll sell. When the market's 10, you offer me 10, I'm not selling. 10 to 9? For sure not, unless I have to. So are the people going to be in trouble? Yes. Don't listen to people who say, oh, there's people in trouble, have to sell. Let me tell you two points. Number one, the amount of people that are in trouble versus how big the pie of business is, is a very small percent. Most of the deals happened, healthy transactions that took place. And even some people that are in, tr are in trouble, they might recapitalize, they might raise equity on their deals. And that's why the, the focus we're putting on is raising LP equity to find people who want to invest directly with the GP to be able to go ahead and make those direct uh, make those sales going. The other reason why there's going to be less sales is I described about 1031 exchange. Even if a deal should make sense to sell, but if they sell the deal, there's not enough money to pay off the tax liability at that time. I go back to a story that we had a client who had a building, two clients bought together a building. One had a used 1031 exchange money and one bought it without 1031 exchange. They got an amazing offer. Let's say it was a $50 million deal. They got an offer to sell it for $60 million. But if they sold it for $60 million, based on the balance of the mortgage, the first person with 1031 exchange didn't have enough profit to pay the 1031 exchange. So therefore, kept holding on to the building at that time. I hope this was beneficial to you to just give you the next steps where the market is. Don't let anyone tell you they're an expert. No one is an expert. Your job is to do the ishtadlis. The non-Jewish word for ishtadlis is inputs. Do the proper inputs in every step of the way. Do the research and get collective thinking. We'll rule the day as we move forward. Best of luck and keep davening.